chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3, and let's all stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word. Ruth chapter 3, Ruth chapter 3, and we're going to read the first, first four verses, Ruth chapter 3 and verse number 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the moor, but make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. This morning I preached on the subject of cheer up, the groom is coming. Now tonight I want to continue with this thought of the coming of the Lord. I want to preach this message, getting ready to meet the groom. Getting ready to meet the groom. Father, help us to get ready. Lord, as we learned this morning, what a beautiful picture Jesus gave to us of we, the church, the bride, and of you, Lord Jesus, the bridegroom. And Lord, at any moment, you could come, and we certainly pray even so, my Lord Jesus, come. But Lord, we know also that as we wait for your coming, there's preparation, there's work to be done. You said in your word, occupy, stay busy till you come. And that's our desire. That's our heart, Lord, as Faith Baptist Church and as members of your church. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to do so. Use the message tonight. Stir our hearts to want to be the, the purest virgin bride that, Lord, that we can be. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, there are certain occasions that we certainly ought to um, dress our best, look our best, act our best, and um, it's getting so now, though, that's not as much the case. I hate to say this, but a lot of people dress so sloppy these days, and um, people don't dress up like they used to, even for certain occasions. But one of those occasions that certainly we, we want to look our best would be our wedding. Um, when, when a bride gets ready for the wedding, that bride is um, putting forth the, her very best effort to look the very best that she can. And, uh, you know, I can remember uh, weddings, our daughters, you know, all, each one of them, they, you know, the day before, even the day of, I don't remember, but probably more the day of, they get their fingernails done and, you know, they got to go to the hairdresser and get their hair done and the makeup and you know, thank God that I'm a guy. You know, man, I just comb my hair and shave, amen, and splash on some cologne, and that's pretty much it. But the girls go through the whole gamut, and, and that's fine. You know what they say, if the barn needs paint, and paint it, right? So they certainly do everything they can to get everything ready. Some of you looking at me smiling, I, I, a penny for your thoughts, amen? And, um, but that is, that's the truth. That, that is an occasion. If you're going to look good, you want to look good for the wedding. Amen? Bride ought to look good. The groom ought to look good. And that's the way it should be. And, and with that said, that is the same attitude we ought to have concerning the coming of the Lord. We ought to look our best for the Lord. Certainly what, we don't want to look like that woman. The, uh, the garbage truck is pulled up to the house. And she hears it and she realizes, oh my, so I didn't put out the garbage. And so she grabs her bathrobe, she throws it on. She runs out the house. Her hair is all in curlers. She's got her face mask on. You know, the cream, oh, that's on her face. She's got her, she's got her old slippers on. And she runs out and she says, am I too late for the garbage? And the man on the back says, no, just jump on in. <laughs> uh, obviously she wasn't looking her best amen the story we just read true account here of Ruth and Naomi and Ruth 
is uh, Naomi tells Ruth, I want you to look your best. And what she was going to do, she is going to meet the man who is her kinsman redeemer. I don't have time to go through all that, but she had lost her husband. And the way the Jewish law worked is the man that was nearest to her as a relative had the right and really the obligation to take her and make her his wife. And that is what um, Boaz was. And so she is going to get ready and Naomi is trying to help her. Now, when you read the story, and because we're, again, we're not familiar with the culture. We don't understand how they did things in those days. And what she did, I mean, going in the middle of the night like that and taking the, his, his, uh, his um, um, blanket off his feet like that and laying at his feet, you know, we would think about that. We'd say, boy, that's a bit aggressive, maybe a bit, a bit provocative, maybe inappropriate, maybe very even questionable. But in those days, it wasn't that way at all. It was actually very appropriate. It was an acceptable gesture of that day to do that. And what it was is it was the very first steps of her uh, trying to be engaged to get married to this man. And this is what by law that they were able to do. And because she knew because of what Naomi told her that this was the rightful man that could be her husband. And so she wanted to get prepared. And so Naomi says, let me tell you what you need to do. And she gives her some instruction there. If you're if you thinking, as I was reading, she says to her, she says, wash thyself. She tells her that you need to anoint thyself. She tells her you need to dress thyself. And so this morning I talked about men being happy and cheering up because the groom is coming. Now tonight, I want you to know how can you get ready. I told you, are you ready this morning? And even Brother Listen said, man, you said we need to get ready, but... How do we get ready? What do we need to do to get ready? And I'm thankful that Naomi gave these instructions because actually those instructions that she gives is what the New Testament teaches we should be doing and getting ready for the Lord's coming. And let's face it, we as God's people, as the bride tonight, we ought to want to look our best for the Lord. I love the verse in Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Now the Lord obviously has a part in us getting ready and I could show you verses about that. By the way, isn't it amazing how much the Bible talks about the second coming? and about getting ready. Truth is, I skimmed over a lot of verses I had in my message for the sake of time, and I still went over, amen? So you ought to be saying, thank you, pastor, thank you for that. But I mean that, a lot of verses, a lot of scripture in the New Testament talking about we need to be getting ready, we need to be waking up, we need to be anxious and, and excited about his coming. And so let me give you tonight what we need to do to get ready as we meet the Lord. By the way, I want to show you something else. I was reading this morning. I shared this with Brother Bill. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I just want you to make you, I want to make sure you understand that I am doing exactly what I'm supposed to do as your pastor. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Saw this verse this morning. And I thought, man, I got to read this. I got to share it with the church because I want you to know. Look what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, actually, let's look at verse number one. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. Uh, boy, every preacher feels like that sometimes. Amen. Bear with me, folks. Listen to me, what I'm trying to tell you. And then he says, and indeed, bear with me. Listen to me is what Paul is saying. Look what he says. He says, for I am what? Jealous over you. With what? Godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a what? Chaste virgin to Christ. Do you all understand what that means? I'm trying to help you to be a good bride. I'm trying to help you to be a holy bride, a righteous bride, including myself here. That's my job. I'm supposed to help you to do that. So the first point is this. Number one, we should cleanse ourselves. If we are going to get prepared for the coming of the Lord, we need to cleanse ourselves. Isn't that what Ruth said? Ruth 3.3. 3. She said, wash thyself, therefore. You know what? We know that, don't we? Okay, you, bride, groom, you're getting ready for the wedding. It's, wedding's at 2 o'clock. 
probably about, I don't know, 10, 11, maybe for the bride earlier than that, for the groom certainly around that time. First thing you're going to do, you're going to say, you know what? I need to go take a shower. I need, to, I need to go clean up. That's the first thing that we as a Christian need to do. If we're going to get ready for the, for the groom to come, for our heavenly Boaz to come, then we need to meet him without spot or without defilement. Now, I understand. Now, uh, I understand that when we stand before the Lord, that we are not going to give an account of sin. Okay? We're not going to be judged for our sin. You understand that, right? Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 says, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Why are we not going to give an account of sin? Because we are in the beloved. Amen? If any man, therefore, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says he's new creation. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I am not going to give an account of one sin when I get to heaven. Why? Because it was all paid for on the cross. Amen. Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So I understand. I am not going to have to go to heaven when the bride when the bridegroom comes. I'm not going to give an account of my sin, but I ought to be cleaning my life up and purifying my life and making my life as as much like Jesus's life as I possibly can. Amen. We need to clean ourselves up. That's why I turn over to 1 John chapter 3 verse 3. I'm so glad this verse is in the Bible. I want you to see it. Most of you know it. Maybe you're not thought about it, but this is a very important verse when it comes to the coming of Christ and preparing ourselves for his coming. Look at 1 John 3, 3. Oh, I love this. He says, and every man that hath this hope in him. What's that hope? The Lord's return. Jesus coming back again. And every man that hath this hope in him. Notice the next two words. Does What does he do? Purifieth himself even as he, Jesus, is pure. That's, that is our responsibility. Like I said this morning, the, uh, w- when the proposal was made, the betro- betrothal was made, that the, the, the groom would go off, and for one whole year, that groom would be preparing a place for them to, to abide together, to live together for that one year. Jesus saved us. We're saved. We're, we have now become the bride of Jesus Christ or a part of the bride of Jesus Christ. He's gone. He's in heaven. One of these days he's going to come back. My responsibility is I am waiting for him is I need to be purifying my life. Why? Even as he is pure. I need to become more like Jesus. I need to be working that on all the time. John teaches us here that having that in- anticipation of the coming of the Lord should have a marvelous, purifying effect on our heart. It makes us want to be ready. It wants us to be pleasing to the Lord. It's kind of like I said this morning, the Surgeon General came. Man, oh man, that's the head man. That's the guy that's really involved, especially in the medical part of the Navy. And boy, we worked hard. I remember we worked for an entire week getting that um, core school up there in Great Lakes all put, literally, literally, I'm not kidding you now, we were down on the ground, Brother Ruckel, with toothbrushes cleaning the grout in the foyer area. We cleaned and we cleaned and we cleaned for an entire week. I'll never forget it, Brother Ruckel, I was down there, we were all standing there in attention as the Surgeon General came in, and we're all standing there, and he just walked by us, he didn't even look at anything we did. And I kind of went, wow, what do you think of that? After all that work, and he just walked by. Now, I want you to know, Jesus is not just going to walk by you. In fact, every one of you have an appointment at the judgment seat of Christ. There there ought to be a fear of God in you right now. That you are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and you are going to give an account of your life. Not your sin, but your life. What, as the song says, what did you do with Jesus? What did you do with Jesus in your life? The Surgeon General walked by, but Jesus isn't going to walk by. And One of the things he's going to be looking for in your life is how much did you become like him? 
How much did you cleanse your life? As you anticipated that wedding day, groom and bride. Brides, you made sure everything about yourself was perfect. You made sure your hair was perfect. You made sure your, your uh, uh, makeup was perfect. You made, sure every, you made sure you smelled perfect. Everything. You worked on everything. Why? Because you wanted to look the very best for the groom that you loved. And I think of what Paul said over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 1. In light of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, having therefore these promises, so he's looking back in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, will not go there for the sake of time, but he talks about being separate. He talks about that we are bought with a price. He talks about the fact that we need to make sure we're cleaning up our lives and cleaning up our lives so we could be pleasing with our Savior and with our God. And here's what he says. He says, having therefore these promises that he's going to come back, we're going to have a relationship with him. Dearly beloved, he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We should be separating ourselves from sinful influences all the time in our life. I'm talking about what you watch on your television. I'm talking about what you watch on your cell phone. I'm talking about the music that you listen to. I'm talking about the people that you talk to and spend time. I'm talking about we should be working on the influences of our life because we want to make sure we are preparing ourselves. Why? Because we want to get our life right for the groom. We had to clean up our lives. If we're going to do that, there's some things we need to do. First of all, there has to be, you have to take a good, hard look at your sin. Now, there is not a person in this room tonight, including this preacher, who does not have sin in his life. And if you think that you don't have sin in your life, you do have sin in your life. And one of the things we need to do is look at ourselves. You, hey, listen, every single, the groom, you, you're getting your tux on, and you, you put your shirt on, and, and, and you, what do you do? You look yourself in the mirror. Oh, any guy ever done this? You, you shave, and you put your white shirt on, and you put it on, and all of a sudden you see that red spot right there. Oh, my soul. So you get, your, you get a towel, and you get a little bit of soap or something. You, oh, you rub the fire out of that thing. You, you don't want that, especially on your wedding, right? Boy, you want to look good. Make sure that tie looks just good. You got that tux on, you're looking at it, and you say, I look pretty good. Yeah. And then you, oh my goodness, you brides, how many times? You, you, you never cease to look at the, you, every time you go by a window, you're looking at yourself. Is everything just fine? And you're checking yourself out all the time. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. You want to look good. Special occasion. You're getting married. You want to look good. And you want to make sure everything's clean. You want to look at your pants. You look at your suit. You want to make sure there's no dirt on it or anything. And, and that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be, listen, every day, I'm saying every single day, you ought to be taking a hard look at your life and looking at the sin in your life and looking at where you're, you're, you're slipping in your Christian life. Because, see, we have a tendency, and we all know this is true, we have a tendency to condone sin in our lives and condemn the sin in other people's lives. Would you all say amen to that? Please don't be a Pharisee right now because you know it's true. Somebody has wisely said we, con we condone in our lives what we condemn in others. And there's a lot of truth to that. I remember preaching, man, always preached about pornography. Man, they, almost every man, man, you ought not, man, you ought not look at pornography. Almost every time. Come to find out he was looking at pornography. So I'm not saying if somebody preaches against something, they're probably doing it. I'm saying what we condone in our lives, we sometimes condemn in other people's lives. And we need to make sure we're, don't, don't get your eyes off of people, friend. The, the, the thing that's going to ruin you the most is you're getting your eyes on other people. Well, so-and-so's this and so-and-so's that. Get your eyes off of people and get in the mirror and look at yourself. James chapter 2, this is the mirror, my friend. You look in this mirror, and after you look at it, you look at yourself through this book, and the Bible says, don't you become a forgetful here, because Holy Spirit's going to speak to you, amen. And so we need to be looking at, hard look, I mean take a hard look at yourself. Turn over to Psalms 139, would you? Psalms 139, I love Psalms 139 
in, in, in Psalms 139, David starts off in that psalm talking about the omniscience of God. Then he talks about the omnipresence of God. Then he talks about the omnipotence of God. And I love that psalm because there's so many wonderful truths in it. But I want you to notice something else at the end of that psalm, what he does. Look at this. And I'm talking about, I'm going somewhere with all this, about taking a hard look at yourself. Look at it. Psalms 139. Now, I'm not going to go in the beginning, but if you read from verse 1 all the way over, let's see, uh, over to verse number 18, you'd see it starts off again with the omniscience of God, that God knows everything. Then it goes to the om omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere. There's nowhere you can go where God is not. And by the way, that ought to put the fear of God in your heart also. And then he goes in the omnipotence of God that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Then look, after he's all done with that, he's just bragging on God, saying how great God is. And look what he then does. He says, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name. So what, what David is saying here, he, he's, he's upset at the people that are upset at God. He's against, he's against those that are against God. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying, God, you need to take care of those people that are against you. It's not so much that he wanted them hurt, but they're against God, and he's, David, saying they deserve something. And look what he says, surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Oh, I hate them with a perfect hatred. The idea is this. Would you all agree we ought to, we ought to hate sin and love the sinner? I believe that's what David is saying here. I hate the sin of those people. I hate the way that they treat you, God. I hate the way that they talk about I hate the way they take, they take the Lord's name in vain. By the way, I hate it too. I hate it when somebody takes the Lord's name in vain. Don't you? That's what he's saying. Now, I'm going somewhere, but look what next. In verse 23, kind of odd, isn't it? Now, look what he says. He says what? Search me, O oh God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. You know what David was doing? David, first of all, talked how, how wonderful God is. Then he talked about those that were against God. And he said, Lord, I hate the sin. I hate the things they're doing. But then he says, Lord, after I got done talking all about them, how wicked they are, would you make sure there's no wickedness in me? I hope there's nothing wicked in me. I hope after I lambasted those people and said all those things about them, wrote these things in this song, Lord, would you just search me and make sure there's nothing in my life? Make sure that I am not condemning in other people's lives what I condone in my own life. Do y'all get that? See, as a Christian, we ought to be taking a hard look at our own lives. Get your eyes off of people. Good night. Stop doing that. One of the most foolish things you'll ever do is get your eyes on people. You know what? I got enough trouble with me to look at other people. You know, the person I have the biggest problem with is the guy I shave in the morning. And I mean that. And I'm too busy working on me to fret about other people. Now, I'll help anybody, and I, that's my goal. That's my purpose in my life. But the truth is, I spend more time working on me than anybody. Why? I'm preparing for my groom to come. I need to take a hard look at my sin. David said, I want to, Lord, if I need to, I want to have a consciousness of what's wrong in my life. Lord, reveal it to me. And that's the thing you need to do. I've called this the hardest prayer a Christian will ever pray. This is the hardest prayer you'll ever pray. I double, I dare you tonight. I double dog dare you tonight to get up to, maybe after the service, maybe even during the service, say, God, search me. No, my heart. Try my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, show it to me. That's a hard prayer to pray. Because I promise you, if you do it with an open heart, God will reveal things to you. God, listen, you've got things in your life. I've got things in my life. And there are things we just don't want to look at. There's things that we don't want to admit in our life. Truth is, if, if God's people would just get right with God, there would be a revival. 
And that's why. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The problem's not the, uh, uh, the Democrats or the Republicans. The problem is Christians. And the bride is not preparing themselves. Bride's not getting ready for the groom. And if the bride, the church, would just get ready and focus on yourself, stop thinking about other people, what they need to be doing or what they shouldn't be doing, and look at your life. Every one of us got a heap of work to do. Heap of work to do. Number one, so number one, make sure you take a hard look at your sin. Number two, this should lead to confession of sin. Now, we don't preach enough about confession. I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, there's one thing the Catholic Church did do good for me. They taught me how to confess. They taught me to go to confession. And I went to confession. I did it a lot. Because I needed it a lot. <laughs> I can quote that prayer, Father, I have sinned. It's been however long since my last confession. Okay, my son, now what, what did you do wrong? And I would go through the list. And the priest would tell me, well, you need to go out there and pray five ha Our Fathers and ten uh, 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 Hail Marys, and, and you need to go to bed early, and you need to do this, and you need to stop doing that. Man, I, I went, oh, at least once a month, I went to confession, whether I liked it or not. Amen? They taught me to confess. And I'm glad they taught me that. Because after I got saved, I learned, boy, I need to confess more than once a month. I need to confess every single day. And I do every day. Every morning, I confess. I acknowledge. I acknowledge the sins of omission, and I acknowledge the sins of commission. I confess the sins that, that I've done wrong, and I confess the things that I should have done that I didn't do. I confess every day to the Lord, Lord, I am so sorry. Forgive me. I don't love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength like I should. And I don't. I confess to the Lord, Lord, I don't pray as much as I should. Every day, Lord, I just, I want to I be up front with you. I, wanna, I want things right. I've taken a long, hard look. I've asked you to search me and try me and show me, and you did, and this is where I'm wrong. And there, and there needs to be confession. David wanted God to make him conscious of anything that was wrong in his life. That's why David was a man after God's own heart. Not because David was perfect. Because David wanted to be conscious of his sin. Now, we know about the sins. We know about what David did wrong. We all understand that. David blew it. He did. But for the majority of David's life, David was a man after God's own heart. In the Psalms 32, turn over to Psalm 32. In Psalms 32, David, David would often do an audit of his heart. And I believe Psalms 32. Spurgeon said Psalms 32 is the psalm that was written by David after he repented, but it was a psalm written about the time, about one year between when David committed adultery and murder to the day that Nathan came before him and said, Thou art the man. For one whole year, David hid his sin. Just like we do. Except some people have done it more than a year. There are some people here, you've had bitterness for years and years and years. Some of you have had other sins in your life for years and years. For one whole year, David, and he confesses that. And look at Psalm 32, verse number 1. He said, blessed is he whose transgression. Brother Bill actually shared this a couple weeks ago. And there was something in there. Boy, after he read it, I read the next verse. I said, man, that's good. Look what it says. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Amen? That's a wonderful thing when you're forgiven of your sin, isn't it? Look at it. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. That means the word imputeth doesn't put it on his account. No debits on my account, amen? I've got a clean account. There is no sin on my account. I am, I am, just, I am justified. I am just as if I never sin in the eyes of God. Somebody say amen. That's what it means to be justified. No, nothing on my, I, I, just like I said, Jesus became sin who knew no sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. I have been made the righteousness of God. That's why when I die, I'm going to heaven. Amen. Not because of my works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Look what he says. In, in, in whose spirit there is no guile. Word guile means deceit, deception, dishonesty. 
David for a whole year was deceitful, was deceptive, and was dishonest with himself. David had committed adultery. David had committed murder. And for a whole year, he hid it in, heart, in his heart. Friend, listen to me tonight. There's guarantee there's somebody here. You've been hiding some sin in your life. You're hiding it. It's in you. Maybe it's a husband. Your wife doesn't know. Maybe it's a wife. Your husband doesn't. Teenager here. Your mom and dad doesn't know. But David hid that sin. And notice what he says, how he felt because, there was that, because of that guile, because of that deceit in his heart. He said, when I kept silence, that, no, he didn't confess it. He wouldn't make it right. When I kept silent, notice, my, bat, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. In other words, he felt guilty all the time. He's always felt bad. Oh, he put on a smile. And the Bible even talks about in the book of Proverbs about how the backside will put on a smile. But in his heart, he, he knows he's not happy. Look, look what he says. He says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. By the way, that's how you know you're a Christian, when you sin and the hand of God, the heaviness, the conviction in it is your life. If you're, if, you're, if you're involved in sin in your life and you don't feel any cotton picking hurt in your heart, any conviction, any guilt in your heart, my friend, you probably are not saved. You're not saved, friend. There is no way a saved person can continue on and sit and be happy about it. You can't do it, man. You've got the Spirit of God in you. He is called the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says you grieve that Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, which by you are sealed until the day of redemption. He'll never leave you. But man, that, and by the way, that grieving there, the word grieve there is if someone grieved as if they lost their mother. You look it up. I lost my mother in a car accident. I know that grief. That's a terrible grief. And I'm just, I'm preaching tonight, amen? amen? We're getting ready for the bride. This is serious business getting ready for the, for the groom, amen? amen? Serious business. Jesus is coming again. The church needs to get, get serious about this thing. Right. Every member of the church needs to get serious about this thing. And so, he, look what he says. He says, now look at Selah. He said, drought of summer. He said, Selah. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. He got to the point he couldn't even cry anymore. Think about it. Selah, David said. Think about that. I acknowledge my, now look at this. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now look at verse 6. This is what I read. After Brother Bill read those verses right there. Look at this. I want you to see love. Think about that. Then he said this. For this shall every one that is, what's that next word? Godly. Pray. Didn't say wicked pray. Didn't say sinful pray. Godly. Godliness doesn't mean that you're perfect or sinless. Godliness means that when sin comes into your heart, you deal with it. And you don't wait for somebody to catch you. That's, that's, that's earthly sorrow. When somebody says, I'm sorry because I got caught. That's not real repentance. That's not real sorrow. Godly sorrow is when you don't need somebody to point out what you did wrong. Godly sorrow is when you've done something. It could be just you said an unkind word to somebody, and the Spirit of God smote your heart. And you said, boy, I'm so sorry I said that word. That's where a godly person, David said, this is the kind of stuff that a godly person does. Godly people confess their sin. I believe in confession. We don't preach enough about confession. Let me, and by the way, let me just ask you, and you won't, I don't want you to answer me, but you will answer me because I'm asking the question. That's why I love questions. Jesus always, read about Jesus, always ask questions. Didn't expect answers because he knew you already answered the question. You don't have to say a word to him. When's the last time you confessed? Teenagers. Hey, moms, when's the last time you confessed anything? Anything. You say, boy, it's been a long time. Really? 
It's been a long time. So what you're saying is you don't have any sin, which we know is not true. So he says you should be confessing sin every day. Because every day you blow it. Would you agree with that? So every morning you ought to get up. You ought to say, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the, in the life, into life everlasting. I'm not, I'm not being unkind here. I'm trying to help you get ready. If you're going to be a beautiful bride, if you're, going to, if you're going to help the church to be a beautiful bride, then the first thing, you've got to get cleaned up. Naomi said, Ruth, clean thyself. Man, you're going to go meet Boaz. He's going to be your, your groom. You've got to get, man, look good, smell good, get yourself ready to go. Oh, listen, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You'll never... One of the things that hinders a lot of Christians from growing is they don't know how to confess. They, they spend no time at confess. Most don't pray at all, but even then when they pray, they don't spend time confession. Confession. And by the way, the joy, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. One of the jo- you know what one of the greatest joys of Christian life is? Being forgiven. Man, it's such a blessing to be forgiven. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why you want to forgive other people. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, you'll, you will not, as a Christian, know the joy of being forgiven when you come to the Lord if you have unforgiveness towards somebody. Isn't that good? So if you're going to be forgiven and know the joy of forgiveness, you better make sure you have nothing against anybody. That's why we don't see as many happy Christians as we need to see. Amen? amen. This is serious business, eh? Somebody say amen. amen. Man, you've got to get cleaned up. You've got to have a hard look at your sin. You gotta, there's got to be confession of your sin. Man, you've got to look at it like it is. Then, the, then that leads to a cleansing of sin. 1 John 3, 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The objective of preparation is to get a clean life for the groom. That's the objective. First John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. Now the rest of the verse talks about, but if he sin. I, and I like that. And if any man sin, so he's saying, Jesus is saying, uh, I would prefer you didn't sin at all. But if you do sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, he is the propitiation. He is the sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, Calvinists. Amen. Now listen to me. The goal that God has for us as a bride is that you wouldn't sin. But if you do sin, thank God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pastor, if you've got to confess every day, man, you must be a pretty bad Christian. I, I am. And I'm working on it all the time. But I just know me. We sin in our words, we sin in our thoughts, and we sin in our deeds. Now, if you'll take time and look at each, each one of those things every morning, I got a sneaking suspicion that you just might find one or two things. You think? Deal Moody got done one time and preaching about sin, and a lady came up. She said, uh, Mr. Moody, as you were preaching about sin and getting things right, I just couldn't think of one thing. Mr. Moody said, well, ma'am, why don't you just get down to that altar and ask the Lord. I think he might show you a few things. And that's exactly the way I feel. Get up in the morning and say, Lord, show me what's wrong with me. Right. Oh, boy, he'll help you so much. He'll help you so much. So we gotta, we got to gotta clean ourselves up. We gotta get to the point where we confess our sin. That should be our attitude. Is we ought, we don't want to live in sin. We don't want to keep having sin in our life. Hey, Paul said, "I want to see sin as exceeding sinful." You know, if you guys go out work on a car, and you work in the car, and you get all this grease on you. Now, tell me the truth. You you may be one of those guys you don't mind, but when you get all that grease on you, the first thing you're thinking, man, I want to get cleaned up, right? You're not thinking, well, I think, I'll go, I think I'll go get a hamburger. And then you don't even clean your hands you eat with the hamburger. No, there's something about us. We don't want to have all this dirt on us. 
We want to be clean. We see that as, oh, that's just so dirty. I want to get clean. That's the way we need to look at our sin. We need to look at sin as exceeding sin, folks. Boy, I've got that. I said that. I said something about somebody yesterday. That's bad. I want to get that right. I want to be clean. There was a preacher. His name was, was uh, John B. Gow. He's back in the early 1900s. He was a great preacher on temperance. He preached against drinking. And he actually died while he was preaching. I was driving from Bakersfield down to Long Beach, going down to teaching the college down there at, the Espo, at Brother Esposito's college. I always started out at 2.30 in the morning to drive down there. And I'm driving down there, driving the grapevine, and I'm listening to the news. And, uh, and, this, and they gave this, this um, news about a preacher in Florida. And the preacher was preaching behind his pulpit. He said, I want to die preaching behind this pulpit. I want to die preaching behind And he died. He fell over and had a heart attack while he was preaching. And he said that. I thought, man, what a way to go. <laughs> Amen. Preaching the word of God. I wouldn't mind going like that. I wouldn't want to do it in front of you, but <laughs> you probably feel pretty bad about it. Well, I hope you would at least. But um, this preacher, he's preaching away. And the last sentence that he said in the last sermon he preached was this. Young men, keep your record clean. Young men, keep your record clean. Man, we live in a wicked, 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 wicked world. Man, I want Jesus to come back. So wicked. These cell phones are so wicked. So much junk and garbage and things that I hear about people and men get involved in things and girls getting involved in things. It's just so, man, when I was a kid, good night, we watched clean things and our lives were... Compared to now, we were just about as pure as the white driven snow. Seriously. We, we, we just, we, we, we got in trouble, but, you know, I threw a rock through a window. That's about the extent of my trouble. Now we see young people, elementary students doing wicked things. Junior age kids doing wicked things. Teenagers doing wicked things. Husbands doing wicked things and wives doing wicked things. And the problem is we're not confessing. We're not cleansing. We're not washing ourselves. What a great call to all Christians. Young men, keep your record clean. Number two, we should consecrate ourselves. Look what she says. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee. Anoint thee. The act of anointing of oil is a beautiful custom in the Bible. It has a wonderful teaching in it. Here, the anointing of oneself was the pouring of oil that had all these herbs and all these wonderful smells in them, and these women would, would, would cleanse themselves. And they'd pour that fragrance upon them. The fragrance of the anointing oil, they would prepare themselves that they would meet that man. Usually what they would bathe and they would clean themselves. Then they would anoint themselves with this, with this ointment. They only said, I want you to smell good when you meet Boaz. Remember Esther, when Esther first came and became a part of the harem, if you would, of the king, that for one whole year she could not go and even meet the king because of the food that they ate, their body. Sometimes there are certain people because of the food. I took garlic for a long time, and it got to the point every time I sweat, I smell like garlic. And my wife asked me, please don't take any more garlic. But Esther for a whole year had to eat the, the food that the king ate because she smelled, because of the smell that she gave off. And then once that, all that food and whatever she put in her body was gone, then they, began, they anointed her so she could go before the king. So it was important to smell good. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Turn over there, would you? 2 Corinthians 2.14. Notice what Paul says about us. It says, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest, notice the word there, savor of his knowledge by us in every place. You look up that word, the word means aroma, it means fragrance. He's talking about the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. So the, the knowledge that they had of God and living out that knowledge of God in their life was actually like a sweet aroma. He goes on to say, for we are unto God a sweet 
aroma, a sweet fragrance of Christ in them that are saved and in them that, are, that perish. See, he's talking, what, what he's, Paul's referring to, once again, the culture, when, when the Roman army would come back from a victory, there was an incense that they would burn when the Roman army would came saying that there was a victory. So when people all over the city smelled that, that, that incense, they knew that smell very well, and they knew, oh my, that means Rome had another victory. And people would come out to the, to the parade because that smell told them and reminded them that there's a victory. By the way, don't we do the same thing? Hey, some of you remember growing up, there's certain food your mom made. And you, maybe you've gone somewhere and you smell, and that's, oh, that smells just like what my mother used to make. Or the bread. Or a cologne. I used, I'd put a cologne on, and sometimes I'd hope when my girls were a little small, I'd have a cologne on, and I'd, and I'd hold them in my arm. And then my wife would take them eventually, and she, smell, she would say, they smell just like you, which was a good thing. And Paul says there that we as Christians, we ought to be a sweet fragrance of Jesus Christ. He's not talking so much about what we do. He's talking about how we do it. He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about kindness and graciousness, being friendly, being helpful, trying to help people, encourage people, not being a critic. That smells. What, what would it be like if the bride comes, the, the, the bride comes down the aisle and the, and the groom goes down to get her and he comes up and he says, you smell good. <laughs> now that's not going to happen. Okay, I know that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm being silly. I know that. But can I, honestly, some Christians stink. Your attitude stinks. The way you talk stinks. Pastor, you're not being very nice today. Well, I'm trying to get you ready. Amen. Amen. Some you got to be. Able, but we stink. Hey, sometimes we're like the guy who uh, stunk so bad that when he put on odor eaters, he disappeared. There's some stinky Christians. Their attitudes. And I'm talking about your spirit. You know, I don't know if I should say this. You know, sometimes when people come around you, one of the first things you do is you smell them. Is everybody okay? You smell them. I mean, right away. If that, you know, sometimes they'll say, hey, that's a, I like that cologne. Right? Some, I wouldn't say this to a lady, but another lady would say, boy, what's that perfume you're wearing? You know, ladies do that all the time, right? Don't, don't you? You smell them. You smell. If you smell good, great. If you smell bad, that's not so good. But there's another thing that you smell. And I mean this in a spiritual way. You smell their spirit. You don't have to, you can, you don't have to hang around somebody very long before you know their spirit. Brother Justin. Brother Justin always has a great spirit. I've never seen him come in grumpy. Never. Never one time. I've never seen him come in and say, I'm not talking to you today. <laughs> There's a girl um, in my church, a uh, Magno girl. What was the Magno girl's name? Brianna. She's just like six years old. I w we went to the birthday party, and we were sitting at a table. <laughs> She's only six years old. She's on this side, I'm on this side, we're, having, we're eating, and she's sitting over there. And so I just, you know, I like to make conversation. I said, Brianna, how are you doing today? And she looked at me, and she said, this is not a good time. <laughs> Six years old! I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, man, oh, man. Now, she's a sweetheart now, but... I'll never forget that. Six years old. But this is not a good time. I, I got a hold of her, her spirit right there, amen? And, and I'm serious now. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the fruit. He's talking about your spirit. Listen, when, you, when that day comes that Jesus comes back, I hope your spirit's good when he does. Some of you, when you're going to go up, you're going to be stinking on the way up there. Yeah, I said it. What are you going to do about it, Amen. <laughs> I'm saying you got to get yourself cleaned up. Got to get yourself cleansed. Got to get yourself anointed. Got to smell good. 
Smell good for your groom. Purpose of anointing. By the way, I love what they said about Ruth, what Boaz said. He said, for all the city, he said this to Ruth when Ruth came to her. I love this, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Ruth looked at her and said, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Wow. He said, Ruth, you could have had any guy in this city you wanted. You could have had a rich man, you could have had a poor man, anybody you want. And you know why? Because everybody in this city knows. Ruth is a virtuous woman. She had the fragrance, amen. The oil symbolizes consecration, commitment to the Lord. Now go to the last thing. We should clothe ourselves. We should clothe ourselves. Look at Ruth 3, 3 again. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee. Put thy raiment upon thee. The idea of raiment, she said to him, I want you to put on the prettiest dress you got, Ruth. When she came there, she was wearing widow garments. While she was there, she was working, well, she was wearing working garments. Naomi says, Ruth, no working garments. You're going to go see Boaz. Clothe yourself. The idea being, put your best dress on. Put the best perfume on. Get yourself all cleaned up. You're going to go meet your kinsman redeemer. This is the guy you're going to marry. You need to impress him. You need to look the best that you can. And that's what we should want as Christians. We want to make sure we're putting on the appropriate clothes in our Christian life. The Bible says we need to put off something, and we need to put on something. The Bible talks about adorning the doctrine of the Word of God. That means we need to be taking this book and applying the word of God in our life. I love, over years ago, the British Parliament, they wore swords when they came in the House of Commons. Now, you've ever watched them in the House of Commons? You ever see them, how they treat each other? They yell at each other. I love to watch them. You ever watch them? The Labor Party against the Conservative Party, and, and they're bo on both sides, and, and their steps go way up. I love it, actually. I think we should do it here. Man, one guy's talking down there, and the other one's saying, hear, 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 and they're all yelling and standing up and cheering. To me, it's exciting. But years ago, they had these swords, and, and they were always afraid that these guys, these British guys would get so angry at each other that they, they said, now, now, we need to do something. We need to get you guys away from each other so you don't kill each other. So the, the, the person that was in charge of that, I forgot what his name is, so he divided them up, and he put a line right down the middle. And the line was one sword's length away, two sword's length away in a foot. So that way if they took out their sword, they couldn't stab each other. And every once in a while, one of them would get so mad that it would begin to go over the line. And the term was made there, toe the line. Toe the line. In other words, he'd say, toe the line! In other words, you get back from that line and you stay on your side. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Listen, every Christian ought to be, have a line. Over here's the world. Over here ought to be us. Christian, Christians have no business being over here. Okay? I don't care. I don't, listen... You can never prove to me that we can take the way, the fashions of this world, the way of this world, and apply it to our life. I I'll give you verse after verse. Man, touche, let's fight. <laughs> Christians ought not be of the world. In the world, but not of the world. Amen? Amen? And what we need to do, we need to put a line uh, in, the, in the ground and say, you know what, I'm, my toe's on the line. I'm not going to go over on that side. I am, the, I am the bride to the groom. He does not want me to be like the world. He wants me to be like him. You cannot mess with the world and be like Jesus. You cannot do both. And so as Christians tonight, I'm done. So as Christians tonight, we need to understand. Last verse, turn over to 1 John and I'm done. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 28. We ought to be attractive. We ought to look good. We ought to act good. I like the young minister went about 
when about to be ordained, stated that at one period of his life, he was nearly an infidel. But said he, there was one argument in favor of Christianity, which I could never refute, the consistent conduct of my own father. We need those kind of dads. Dad, when you leave here and you go home, I hope your life is consistent. I hope you are living, this, you, are, you, you are being the same kind of Christian that you make yourself look like here. It's one thing to put it on here. It's another thing to go home and act it. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now little children abide in him. Look at that when he shall appear. We may have confidence. And look at this and not be what? ashamed before him at his coming. And then he says this, if you know that he is righteous, do you know he's righteous tonight? Did you, do you know that? Then look, ye know then that everyone that doeth righteousness is what? Get a hold of that, friend. If you are born of him, you're not perfect. But there is a desire in your heart to do what's right. I don't know about you, but I want to do what's right. And so when he comes, are you going to be ready when he comes? I hope when he comes, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That I'm being what I ought to be. And may I just close this with one thought. I didn't mention it this morning, but the ten virgins, when the bride, when the groom comes, it talks about the, the ten virgins. Five of them are wise because they had the oil. Five of them were foolish because they didn't have the oil. The five that had the oil, when the marriage supper, which lasted for seven days, man, that's my kind of party right there. I mean, they ate for seven days. That was one of the preparations of the groom. He had to get ready just for the marriage feast of the lamb. They were able to go in. The ones that weren't ready, by the way, in a church... In every church, there are lost people. By the way, they thought they were saved. The foolish ones thought they were saved. But they didn't have the oil. And when they closed the doors, because they didn't have the oil, they came to the door, the door was shut. And someone said, I never knew you. You know, when the Lord comes, are you going to be ashamed of the fact that you weren't even ready? Spiritually, you really weren't saved? You, you prayed a prayer, but you never really got saved. Can I tell you something? When you get saved, you know it. And then if you are saved, will you be ashamed? If Right now, right now, okay? Jesus comes. You going to stink? Would you, right now, the, way, the kind of Christian you are right now, would you like to go to Jesus right now and stand before him? Ask, answer, ask yourself that question. Right now, with your heart the way it is, or your attitude the way it is, or your life, the, the things you're watching, the things you're looking at, right now, Jesus came, bang, you're there. Would you be ashamed about your life? Let's pray. Father, please, 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 I've given it all I got tonight. And I've tried, as, as Paul did. I, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of Christians, Lord, that, that are no, they're saved, and yet they just they continue to want to be in this old world, be like the world. God, I want to help them to be, become a chaste virgin for Jesus Christ. That's my job. And so I pray tonight that we would be cleansed, that we would confess, that we would consecrate our life, that we would anoint our life, and that we would clothe ourselves. With Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you say. Every day, put them on. And so please help us. I wonder tonight if there's somebody that would say, Pastor Grandy, I'm not saved. I know I'm not saved.